Okay, folks, let's get started. Nobody wants to get started. I don't either. Should we go home? Lastly, come home. Uh, as you can see, we're having some issues with the screen, and they're looking at it, but they don't know what it is, and I don't know what it is, so hopefully nobody gets hypnotized or goes and has a weird fit as a result of this. But in any event, uh, sorry for the appearance on the screen. I've tried to change it, but we can't do it. Um, last time I got started talking, oh, I, I, one thing I wanted to mention. Um, if you look on the schedule page, um, you will see I added something I didn't mention last time, and this is just for your own interest, if you're interested in it, I uh, listed a set of medical links. And if you click on that, what you will see is um, a page uh, at Delicious. If anyone knows what Delicious is, it's just a place to store links. And boy, that is really a problem, isn't it? Um, and what I do is I post, I'm teaching a class right now called Molecular Medicine. In that class, I post several times a week new medical links that I get. So if anybody's interested in that, that'd be a good place to check out. And they're c continually being updated. So I will be posting probably about five or six of those links a week. Nothing that you're required to do, but if you're interested, they are there. Okay, um, citric acid cycle. So today we're going to dig in and talk about the reactions of the citric acid cycle, which themselves aren't that interesting or exciting. But what will be more important will be we will be interested in, again, how the cycle uh, fits into all the other big picture that we've talked about and how it will continue to fit in uh, to big pictures as we're going along. But before we do that, we have to, of course, first talk about the um, yeah. first talk about the uh, reactions of the cycle. The cycle, as I mentioned last time, is a circular pathway. It's one of the few circular pathways that we see, and um, I'll just dig right into it. So, as I mentioned last time, we, the cycle does not have a beginning or an end. Uh, in fact, it has. Um, because it is a circle, there's really not a beginning or end. For our purposes, we will call the beginning of the cycle the place where the two carbons get added from acetyl-CoA. So in what we'll talk about, the first reaction of the cycle, um, acetyl-CoA combines with uh, oxaloacetate. The two carbons from acetyl-CoA uh, get joined, and you make uh, ultimately a molecule called citrate. In this mechani these mechanisms I'm going to be talking about, you're going to see a lot of intermediates. Okay? I don't care about the intermediates. Okay? Unless I tell you something about an intermediate, we will act as if the intermediate itself does not exist. Okay? So that will hopefully keep it simple for you. The um, formation of citrate is catalyzed by an enzyme known as citrate synthase. And um, I'm, I am going to uh, ask you to know the structures of the uh, intermediates in the citric acid cycle and also the names of the enzymes in the citric acid cycle. There's only eight intermediates, there's only eight enzymes, and the enzyme name really tells you what it does. The name of this enzyme is called citrate synthase. Yes, Megan. No, I said there were a few that we would do this year, but, but we will be talking, we'll, we'll be doing these, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if I was unclear on that, sorry. Okay, so uh, what I said I think last time was there will be very few uh, structures that I will require you to memorize this term, and they're really stacked up front. So they're stacked in the citric acid cycle for the most part. Okay, so um, citrate is a six carbon intermediate. As I say, its formation is catalyzed by an enzyme known as citrate synthase. And this reaction, which adds these two carbons onto oxaloacetate, is a very energetically favorable reaction. It's a very energetically favorable reaction. It's not too far off of being as energetically favorable as the uh, pyruvate formation reaction in glycolysis. And that was what I called the Big Bang. So this is a pretty <coughs> energetic reaction. Now, it's interesting in looking at this because we don't really have any what would seem to be high energy intermediates. So how is it that this reaction is so energetically favorable? And the answer comes in the form of this bond right here, okay, where my pointer is. This bond right here is a high energy bond. It's a thioester bond between the acetyl group, which is here, or moving around as you can see, and the, co the uh, coenzyme A. 
This is a prime example of what we've talked about last term, which is an activated intermediate. An activated intermediate, I will remind you, is a molecule that has a high energy bond that uses the energy of that bond to donate a part of itself to something else. The part of itself that's being donated here is the acetyl group. And there we go here. So we see an intermediate of CoA. Again, we're not worried about the intermediate. We're worried about the final product over here, citrate. OK, that's the citrate synthase reaction. As we will see when we come all the way back around that cycle, this reaction turns out to be very important that it is energetically favorable. And I'll tell you why when we get all the way back around the cycle. But just keep it's filed in the back of your head. This is an energetically favorable reaction. And its energetical, energetic favorableness is important for the cycle itself. Questions on this? You guys are as dead as last time. You've got to wake up here. What's that? Oh, question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm dead. OK, that's my problem. It catalyzes the entire reaction. It catalyzes the entire reaction. Uh huh. Other question? OK. All right. Um, I heard the noise out here. I thought people were laughing at my joke, but I, should, I guess I should have known better than that. All right. The second reaction of the citric acid cycle uh, involves the formation um, of uh, a molecule called isocitrate. And this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme whose uh, the only one that has a name that doesn't really describe the reaction. The name of the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is aconitase. And it derives its name from the fact that there is an intermediate called cis-aconitate. Since we're not worrying about intermediates, um, it's going to be kind of um, a, an enzyme whose name just sort of sticks out as odd. Okay? Aconitase catalyzes the conversion of citrate into isocitrate. And what's happening in this is we can see that there is a rearrangement. Okay? This is an isomerization. And we can see this OH and this H are basically swapping places. Okay? This guy is a symmetric molecule. If you look at it, it's a carbon, carbon, carbon in the middle. Attached to the carbons are a carboxyl, a carboxyl, and a carboxyl. And in that middle carbon, there's an OH. So that's a perfectly symmetrical molecule. Perfectly symmetrical. When we do this rearrangement, we create a molecule that's not symmetrical. Okay? Not a symmetrical molecule. So isocitrate has this structure. And the movement of this hydroxyl group is important for what will become the next reaction, which involves the first oxidation of the citric acid cycle. Now, I won't really talk much about energies of the individual reactions. I'll spare you that for the most part. The first reaction I said had high energy. And yes, I think you should know that. And we're going to see that when we get all the way around, the last reaction has very uh, low energy. And in fact, it's not very favorable at all. And uh, I'll mention that then. Most of the other reactions, they're favorable, unfavorable, but it's not a big concern for us in the overall reaction. It's not like glycolysis where we had this hump that we had to get over in, in the middle of the thing. OK, so aconitase um, catalyzes that reaction. And um, there's um, the structure. The structure of aconitase. Um, is interesting, and some biochemistry books go into a lot of depth in this. We won't go into it here. But that phenomenon that I just described to you of starting with a symmetric molecule and creating an asymmetric molecule actually has some important implications for the structure of the enzyme. So if you take uh, the majors level biochemistry course, for example, you'll hear a lot about how um, the structure of the enzyme allows the formation of a very specific stereoisomer um, of um, isocitrate. But again, we won't be talking about that here. All right. Now, in the next reaction of the citric acid cycle, isocitrate, which is still a six carbon molecule, all we did in the previous reaction was just rearrange the uh, position of the hydroxyl. In the next reaction of the citric acid cycle, we have an oxidation and a decarboxylation. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase. It is an oxidation. It is an oxidative decarboxylation. Okay. 
And um, what's happening here is that the um, uh, carboxyl group is, um, is being um, uh, kicked off of the molecule. The carboxyl group that's being kicked off is actually this middle guy right here. That leaves us with a five carbon molecule that looks like this. And the five carbon molecule is named alpha ketoglutarate. Okay. Now alpha ketoglutarate turns out to be an intermediate in amino acid metabolism. So now we see that uh, the citric acid cycle is overlapping with amino acid metabolism because alpha ketoglutarate can very, very easily be converted into glutamic acid. All you have to do is swap this double bonded oxygen for a nitrogen, and you've got glutamic acid. So this reaction where that oxygen and the nitrogen are being swapped is known as a transamination. And transamination reactions are very common for amino acids. So this is a very, very important intermediate in, in uh, amino acid metabolism. It's also an important intermediate in the citric acid cycle. So this means that if the cell has extra alpha ketoglutarate, the cell can use that extra alpha ketoglutarate and make glutamic acid. It also means that if the cell has extra glutamic acid, let's say you are on a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, this is a really good way to get energy because you can convert the glutamic acid that's in the protein into alpha ketoglutarate and now oxidize it in the citric acid cycle. Virginia. Uh, the, the, that's the next reaction. Uh, the, the, are you talking about the formation of this? I'm talking about the glutamic acid. From glutamic acid. Okay. So our question is, what catalyzes the formation of this or the conversion of this to glutamic acid? Um, I'll tell you here because we'll talk about it later. The uh, name of the enzyme is called transglutaminase. Transglutaminase. And transglutaminases um, are uh, general. They work on a wide variety of amino acids. And they basically do what I said earlier, which is that they swap oxygens and nitrogens. So transglutaminase converts alpha ketoglutarate to glutamic acid. Transglutaminase is not a part of the citric acid cycle. Okay? So if we're taking something out of the citric acid cycle or we're bringing it in from somewhere else, we need transglutaminase. But transglutaminase is not a part of the citric acid cycle. Okay. So we've had our first decarboxylation. Uh, I should point out that when we did the original reaction, okay, the two um, carbons that we added were up here. Notice that the first decarboxylation uh, resulted in the, uh, the fact that we didn't lose anything here. Okay? We didn't lose anything uh, here. Now, I'm sorry, I, I've actually got it backwards. The two we added were down here. The two we added were down here. So we haven't lost our original two. And we'll see in the next round of reaction, we're going to lose this one, and we're still going to have our original two. So that means before, when we add two carbons in the cycle, we don't lose them as carbon dioxide until the second time around. The first time around, they stay there intact in the molecule. Okay. Oh, the last thing, the next thing. Because it's an oxidation reaction, of course, we're making NADH. So don't forget that we're making uh, NADH because we have an oxidation reduction reaction that's going on. And in the next reaction of the cycle, Alpha ketoglutarate, which is now a five carbon molecule, is converted into a four carbon molecule by yet another oxidative decarboxylation. Okay, you see the CO2 coming off. The CO2 comes off from the top here. And that leaves us with succinyl CoA. Now, this enzyme is interesting in a couple of perspectives. One is um, it is uh, obviously necessary for the citric acid cycle to uh, occur. From the second perspective is, this is the enzyme that I mentioned that had exactly the same, almost exactly the same structure and the same cofactors as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. This enzyme is called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase has pretty much the same general structure, same mechanism as pyruvate dehydrogenase, same cofactors. It has five coenzymes, lipoic acid, diamond pyrophosphate, acetyl-CoA, NAD, and FAD. It uses all of those same coenzymes that pyruvate dehydrogenase used. Now, this is an oxidative decarboxylation, so of course we're going to convert NAD into NADH. 
And this oxidative decarboxylation provides some energy. So this is an energetic reaction. We don't, we're not worried so much about the energy. Other than the fact that we're making, look at what we're making here. We are making another thioester bond. And thioester bonds, as we learned earlier, have a lot of energy in them. And this thioester bond has a lot of energy in it. Okay? So the energy of the oxidative decarboxylation is used to help make a molecule that has a high energy bond. Now, this guy turns out not to be an activated intermediate. We'll see why in a minute. Okay? But this high energy is used for doing something. It is used for doing something. Yes, sir. Kyle. What's that? Nope. Um, all we're doing is, if you remember, we've added two carbons, and we're losing two carbons. They're different carbons, but the net amount of carbons is, is uh, the same. So two come in, two go out. Two come in, two go out each time around. That's really the only significance. Okay. All right, so so far we've made two NADHs. We've lost two carbon dioxides. We've also now made a high energy bond, and that high energy bond is used to, to catalyze a reaction that involves a substrate level phosphorylation. How did I define, excuse me, how did I define substrate level phosphorylation last year? Last, yeah, last year. Anybody remember? Anybody know where we saw substrate level phosphorylation? Does anybody remember anything? <laughs> Jody? Um, it's in glycolysis. I won't say it doesn't require oxygen because it's true, it doesn't require oxygen, but that's not the, the, the thing that makes it a substrate level. Other, I heard another voice. Okay, so, so that's true too. That's, that's true too, but <laughs> but but that's not what it, what the definition is. So a substrate level phosphorylation involves a high energy intermediate that allows phosphate to be put onto AT, onto ADP to make ATP directly. We'll see that that's not the most common way that cells make ATP. High energy intermediates are kind of hard to come by. Okay. But that's what a substrate level phosphorylation is. A high energy intermediate donates energy to putting an ADP, uh, putting a phosphate onto ADP. In this case, it's a GDP. I shouldn't say ADP. In this case, it's a GDP, making GTP. But in any event, we're making, we're converting a diphosphate into a triphosphate. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called succinyl CoA synthetase. Does this seem odd to anybody? Succinyl CoA synthetase. What's a synthetase do? It synthesizes something, right? So this guy is called succinyl CoA synthetase. What are we doing in this reaction? We're breaking down succinyl CoA, aren't we? Does the enzyme have the wrong name? I hear some, yeah, I'll go for that one. I'll brave on that one, right? Okay. No, it's not the wrong name. It's just named for the opposite reaction. When the enzyme was first isolated, they were studying the reverse reaction. So they named it for the reaction that they were studying, which was the formation of succinyl CoA. All enzymes essentially can convert reactions in either direction. So it's not misnamed, although it certainly seems like it's misnamed if we look at, look at it in the direction of the citric acid cycle. Succinyl CoA catalyzes this reaction. Okay, we are back now to another symmetric molecule. Perfectly symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical molecule. Succinate is a four carbon intermediate. We've gone through our two oxidative decarboxylations. We've formed our two carbon dioxides. Now, all that's left in the citric acid cycle to do is to convert succinate back to a four carbon molecule that we started with, which was oxaloacetate. So the remaining reactions are going to involve the conversion of succinate into oxaloacetate. Mechanism, no. Okay.
In the next reaction, succinate is oxidized. Okay? So we're going to have our third oxidation, but of course there's no carbon dioxide loss. This oxidation involves transfer of protons and electrons from succinate onto FAD to make FADH2. Okay? From FAD uh, to make F uh, from succinate onto FAD to make FADH2. You can see the loss of those protons and electrons by what's left, the fumarate. Fumarate has a double bond. And this reaction, we're going to see a parallel when we talk about fatty acid oxidation later in the term. We're gonna, I'm going to remind you of this reaction at that time because this reaction, which involves taking two carbons and taking two hydrogens away from them and generating a double bond, we'll see exactly that sort of thing happen in fatty acid oxidation. This uh, reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as succinate dehydrogenase. And this is the only enzyme of the citric acid cycle that's not found in the matrix of the mitochondrion. It's, this enzyme is bound in the membrane of the mitochondrion. It's in the membrane of the mitochondrion. Inner. It's an inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And we'll see that this enzyme actually plays a role in electron transport. Okay? We'll talk about that later. But for our purposes, we've had an oxidation. We've converted a, um, um, a saturated intermediate to an unsaturated intermediate. We've formed FADH2. And we're ready to go on to the next step. Okay? The next step is very simple. From your organic chemistry, I hope you remember that double bonds are reactive towards water. And water will add across those double bonds to uh, put a hydrogen on one of the carbons and a hydroxyl on the other carbon. This creates a four carbon molecule called malate. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called fumarase, F-U-M-A-R-A-S-E. Makes sense, it starts with fumarate, right? There's really not much to say about this reaction other than the fact that it creates now an asymmetric intermediate. There is a carbon that has four different things on it, as we can see there. So the, there's a stereoisomer that's created. The stereoisomer that's made is known as L-malate. Okay? And L-malate is um, uh, just a, an intermediate for the next step of the reaction. We'll see that uh, malate, actually we won't see, but I will tell you, malate plays an important role in a couple of things. One, in amino acid metabolism, and the other in moving things across membranes. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So malate plays an important role in moving things across membranes, specifically the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Now, the next reaction is finally, we're almost to the end. And the next reaction is the conversion of malate back into oxaloacetate. So we're almost back to our starting point. This reaction, I think, is uh, probably the most interesting reaction or the most unusual reaction of the citric acid cycle. It is an oxidation. We're converting an alcohol into um, a ketone. So that means we're losing electrons and protons from malate. They're donated onto NAD to make NADH. Most oxidations that we see are energetically favorable. This guy is not very energetically favorable. In fact, if we start with equal concentrations of the two, the reaction is favored in the backward direction. That means that we have a delta G0 prime for this reaction, malate going to exaloacetate. The delta G0 prime for this reaction is, is positive. Now. If we have a positive delta G0 prime going on here, that means if we didn't have anything else going on, we're not going to make much oxaloacetate. We're going to be going backwards. We don't want the cycle going backwards. We want the cycle going forwards. Now you think back to the citric, citrate synthase reaction that had a very negative delta G0 prime, which means that it's pulling, it's taking away as much oxaloacetate that gets made, and that pulling is actually what keeps this reaction going forwards. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as malate dehydrogenase. Malate 
dehydrogenase. Very unusual reaction. It's a rare biological oxidation that is not very favorable in the forward direction. It actually has to be pulled by the citrate synthase reaction, which is what happens in the very next step. I'll let you digest that for a minute. Any questions? The reactions are kind of boring. Okay? They're kind of boring reactions. Now, what's important about the citric acid cycle, and one of the reasons I ask you to know the intermediates in the citric acid cycle is I'm going to show you a figure in a little bit that shows how the citric acid cycle ties into many other pathways. The citric acid cycle is a pathway that we describe as anaplerotic. A-N-A-P-L-E-R-O-T-I-C. Anaplerotic reactions. The term anaplerotic means, literally, to fill up. To fill up. Now, what does this mean? You saw, for example, in the case of alpha-ketoglutarate, how alpha-ketoglutarate could be converted into glutamic acid if the cell needed to make glutamic acid. Conversely, if the cell had too much glutamic acid, it can convert it into alpha-ketoglutarate and be oxidized in the citric acid cycle. So it kind of went both ways. Exaloacetate that you see right here, you've already seen as an intermediate in the gluconeogenesis pathway. I'll tell you also that exaloacetate can easily be converted into aspartic acid. Aspartic acid, all you have to do is, just like the glutamic acid reaction, you simply have to convert the oxygen into a nitrogen, and you've got aspartic acid. This pathway can be used to fill up the cell's needs. Now, these are two simple amino acids that this can be converted into, but it turns out that about uh, 12 to 15 of the amino acids can actually either be made from citric acid cycle intermediates or their breakdown products can be made into citric acid cycle intermediates. So this provides a sort of a buffer. As the cell needs these things, it takes them away, filling things up. If the cell has too much of some of the amino acids or other metabolites, and there's other things besides amino acids that enter into play here, the cell dumps them in the citric acid cycle and fills it up. So an anaplerotic pathway is involved in filling up and sort of providing the cell for the cell's needs. And this is, uh, this is all handled through here. Now I'll show you a figure, as I said, in a minute that uh, depicts that for you. Okay. Um, there's all the reactions in one place for you. Um, there's the summary, which I don't recommend, but you can look at it if you wish. And while I'm on the subject of anaplerotic, I'll show you right here. So this shows some of the different pathways that intermediates in the citric acid cycle play roles in. You see a variety of amino acids um, that uh, play off of here. You see some of the amino acids that play off of here. You also see that this guy interacts with fatty acids, sterols, which include things like cholesterol, okay? Uh, porphyrins, which are important for making heme for your um, bloodstream. Um, chlorophyll, if you're a plant. And up here, look at this, purines and pyrimidines. And if, as if that's not enough, oxaloacetate can be made into glucose. The intermediates in this pathway are intermediates in every important pathway in the cell. Nucleotides proteins, sugars, three big categories, three essential components for life, and three things that are found in every living cell on the face of the earth. So the citric acid cycle is central to many, many, many things. If the cell is low on energy, it'll be reflected in the citric acid cycle. If the cell is low on energy, it's not going to be making nucleotides. And that's important because you don't want to be dividing if you don't have the energy to do it. So the citric acid cycle helps provide a good barometer of the cell's energy state and helps the cell to respond to its environment depending upon its own state uh, of energy. And we'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a bit. 
And no, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this, okay? I just show you this for information. You're not going to have to reproduce this for me. All right. Let's see. Um, We've already shown you how, I've already shown you how the cycle relates to glycolysis. Glucose converted to pyruvate, pyruvate converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can go to several things. If we have a need for energy, we will run the citric acid cycle because the citric acid cycle provides us with NADH and FADH2, which are great sources of energy for making ATP. So if we need the energy, we're going to go to the left. On the other hand, if we're not needing the energy, such as, what, such as would happen when we're not exercising and we're eating more than we really should, acetyl-CoA is going to go into lipids. And by lipids, for our purposes today, we're going to think fat. Acetyl-CoA is a source of material for making fatty acids. Now, many of you remember my lecture from last term. I know because I got emails from you uh, where I talked about high fructose corn syrup and how high fructose corn syrup, I said, was bypassing some regulation in glycolysis. And what I said it was doing was it was forcing the production of pyruvate. When you force the production of pyruvate, what do you suppose is going to happen to it? It's going to go to acetyl-CoA. And if you have acetyl-CoA but you don't need the energy, what's going to happen? You're going to make fat. So you can see now the interconnectedness of sugar intake and the um, production of fat. We'll talk a lot more about production of fat later in the term. Uh, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is regulated by covalent modification. Covalent modification. Phosphorylation of it causes the enzyme to become inactive. Dephosphorylation of it causes it to become active. All right. Now let's think back to last term, which I know you guys aren't very good at doing so far. So maybe I'll give you another chance to do it and do it now. Okay. Thinking back to last term, when we stimulated a cell with epinephrine, we stimulated phosphorylation of a variety of enzymes. Everybody remember that? Okay. And if we think about the enzymes involved in um, Glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, does anybody remember what phosphorylation of enzymes stimulated? Glycolysis or gluconeogenesis? Glycolysis. <coughs> gluconeogenesis. Nice try, though. You had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> OK. So gluconeogenesis got stimulated, <coughs> right? OK. So if gluconeogenesis is being stimulated, do we want to be converting our pyruvate into acetyl-CoA? No, we don't because we need pyruvate to make oxaloacetate so that we can go up and make glucose. If we start taking our pyruvate away, we're not going to make glucose. So it makes sense under those conditions that we phosphorylate the enzyme and the phosphorylation results in the inactivation of the pyruvate dehydrogenase because if we activate pyruvate dehydrogenase, we're going to convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA instead of going up into making oxaloacetate. Understand that? So phosphorylation, which is stimulating gluconeogenesis, is also turning off the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Okay, Turning off the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, that means there's going to be plenty of pyruvate to make oxaloacetate to make glucose. OK. That's not something to worry about. Your book, I think, gives a confusing picture about the regulation of the citric acid cycle. If you look at the book, you'll see uh, indications that, well, there are allosteric regula there's allosteric regulation of the pathway. And that's not really very true. It turns out that regulation of the citric acid cycle is very, very, very simple. It's one of the simpler regulations we're going to see. The primary thing that regulates the citric acid cycle, does it work or does it not work, is the availability of NAD and FAD. Now, we saw that in glycolysis, if you remember. That's why we had fermentation to keep glycolysis going. Fermentation occurs in the cytoplasm. 
The citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrion. Fermentation cannot bail out the citric acid cycle. Okay? Underline that. Fermentation can only bail out glycolysis. If we run out of FAD and NAD in the mitochondrion, the citric acid cycle will stop. That is the primary regulation of the cycle. FAD and NAD. Now we'll see when I talk about electron transport uh, next week that the concentration of FAD and NAD is a, uh, uh, controlled by a couple of things. One of the most important things is the availability of oxygen. The other is the availability of ADP, as we will see. You don't need to worry about that yet. Well, it'll make more sense next week when I talk about it. Okay. So this cycle, for our purposes, is controlled by NAD and FAD. ATP, not really a factor. Don't worry about it. Um, Acetyl-CoA, not really a factor. Don't worry about it. ATP, not a factor. Don't worry about it. So for our purposes, we're talking about NAD and FAD. What this is showing you is high NADH inhibits it, which is the same as meaning if there's no NAD, it's not going to happen. Same thing. Too much NADH means you have no NAD. Too much FADH2 means you have no FAD. Okay. Clear on this? Kyle? Okay, very, actually it's a very good question, uh, Kyle. So his question is, how are we, um, phosphor how are we phosphorylating that, that kinase, or uh, how are we phosphorylating pyruvate dehydrogenase? Because it's in the mitochondria, and all these other enzymes we talked about, all these other kinases are in the cytoplasm. Okay? It means that that message actually does get transferred into the mitochondria. The message makes it across there. And that's a complicated thing I won't talk about here, but it's a very good question. So that there are kinases that are in the mitochondrion that have to be activated by that signal that comes from outside the mitochondrion. So the signal makes it across, the molecules don't. Okay? Very good question. Okay, so that's uh, the regulation of the pathway. Now I want you to remember that NADFAD theme because we're going to see how that plays into <coughs> metabolic control. Metabolic control is something I think you'll find very interesting. Okay, now, this uh, again shows some relation to um, what's going on with the rest of the, the, the uh, cell and the needs of the cell. Okay, we can see all these different pathways again interacting. And you can see here that low ATP, okay, turns out to be a stimulant. And it turns out to be a stimulant uh, for other reasons, okay? Um, the most important thing here, ATP doesn't play into the pathway at all. Notice there's no ATP in the pathway. And there aren't any really allosteric uh, enzymes that are, that are regulated by ATP. Low ATP plays a role in a different way. If we have high ATP and we have high levels of NAD and FAD, the cycle will still go on. Understand that. If we have high ATP and we have high NAD and FAD, the cycle will still go on. Okay? There may be times it will stop okay, and reasons it will stop, but it's entirely possible to have both of these going on. And, and we'll talk about some examples of that later. Okay? So to understand that, though, we have to talk about the electron transport cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, and we're not quite at that point yet. Okay. Arsenic poisoning. You know arsenic is very poisonous. You probably don't know why arsenic is very poisonous. The reason arsenic is very poisonous is because arsenic can combine with the sulfhydryl groups on lipoamide. Lipoamide, of course, is an intermediate for pyruvate dehydrogenase and for alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. If we knock out the lipoic acid that's needed for both of these guys, then what do we discover? Okay. Well, we're not going to have either one of those reactions going. And since I've already told you that the citric acid cycle makes probably 90 to 95% of the 
ATP in the cell, you're going to kill the cell. If you can't run those reactions, you're going to kill the cell. And that uh, is obviously not something that's very desirable. And it turns out that if you catch arsenic poisoning early enough, you actually can, uh, in fact, um, uh, prevent it from killing the cell. What you do is you treat it with um, a, a compound called BAL, B-A-L. And it's a longer name than that, and I won't go into the name. But what BAL does, you'll look at BAL here, and you'll see, well, look, it's got sulfhydryl groups as well. And these sulfhydryl groups of BAL actually remove the arsenic from the lipoate and leave the lipoate in its in, in intact form so that the enzyme can function. It says restored enzyme, but this is lipoate on the enzyme. That's what it is, basically. So BAL is a way of rescuing lipoamide on those two enzymes that I talked about and allowing those enzymes to function in the way that they need to. Lipoic acid turns out to be a pretty cool compound. It's a very interesting compound. There's a professor on campus named Tori Hagen who works um, in a laboratory studying reactions in the mitochondrion. And there is very good evidence um, that if we look at lipoic acid in the cell, and we treat cells with lipoic acid, that it appears to have some kind of a protective effect on the mitochondria of cells. Okay, How does that work? Well, if we take a, a, a cell in a laboratory, we grow it up on a plate, and we grow it there for many, many generations. We basically have an old cell, or we take a cell from an old organism, and we take a cell, the same cell, let's say a liver cell from an old organism, an old rat, and a liver cell from a baby rat, and we look at its mitochondria, in the, in the microscope, they look very, very different. The old cell mitochondria is full of what looks like damage to its mitochondria. The mitochondria is all beat up. We'll, we'll understand a little bit why that happens when we talk about electron transport later. But it looks all beat up. It's all beat up because it's, it's accumulated over the years many what are called reactive oxygen species. And you're going to hear more about that this term. The young rat hasn't had that chance to accumulate those reactive oxygen species. And so its mitochondria looks beautiful, pristine. looks like a baby mitochondrion. Okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's like a baby's bottom. It's, it's, in, it's in perfect shape. Right? Hasn't been spanked yet. Right? Okay? So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a good, um, in good shape. Anyway, I want what I'm going, to, going with there. But <laughs> in any event, so you have these two sets of mitochondria. They look very different. If you take an organism and you supplement it with lipoic acid and some other things, and you raise it to the same level as the old rat was before, and you look at its mitochondria, what you see is it looks like a baby's mitochondrion again. Okay? Now, if mitochondria play a role in aging processes and damage that happens in cells, because it's thought that oxidative damage occurs uh, in cells and causes problems uh, in cells, then lipoic acid may turn out to be something very cool for uh, processes like aging, life, uh, cellular, uh, um, life extension, things like that. Okay? And so it's a very hot area for research right now. It's not fully understood how and why it does that, but the results are uh, it looks like that it does do that. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, I say that in preparation for one last thing. No, we're not going to finish early today. We did that last time. You guys just look like you want another pathway, something awful, right? Okay. I know you do. You love pathways. And here's a pathway, and that's the bad news. And the good news is it's a pretty easy pathway. It's a pretty easy pathway because it's related to the citric acid cycle. It uses many of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle. Now, let's look at what this pathway does. This pathway starts with exaloacetate. It gets two carbons from acetyl-CoA to make citrate, same as before, same enzyme as before, citrate synthase. Citrate goes to an uh, isocitrate by a conotase, just like we saw before. We have a six-carbon molecule. In the citric acid cycle, this six-carbon molecule goes through an oxidative decarboxylation and loses carbon dioxide, right? It goes from a six to a five. In the glyoxylate pathway, which is what we're looking at here, this six carbon molecule is split into a two carbon molecule and a four carbon molecule. The two carbon molecule is known as glyoxylate. The four carbon molecule is succinate. Succinate just goes through the rest of the citric acid cycle and goes back up to exaloacetate. 
right? What happens to glyoxylate? This glyoxylate can combine with a second acetyl-CoA. So we have a two-carbon piece. We bring in a second acetyl-CoA. And we make the four-carbon intermediate malate. Now, I've got a couple minutes. I'll finish. This pathway is made possible by the presence of these two enzymes. And yes, these names are important. Isocitrate lyase breaks down the six into a succinate and a glyoxylate. This enzyme is necessary for the glyoxylate cycle to occur. The second enzyme, malate synthase, is necessary for taking this two carbon piece, joining it with this two carbon piece, and making malate. Okay? Now, the clincher is bacteria and yeast and plants have these two enzymes. We don't. Animals cannot run the glyoxylate cycle. We lack these two enzymes. So when we get to the isocitrate point, we have to go through the rest of the citric acid cycle. When bacteria, yeast, and plants get to this point, they have an option. They can go through the citric acid cycle, or they can go through the glyoxylate cycle. We'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that probably next time. Now, the significance of the glyoxylate cycle, notice where it malate. Malate is converted to exaloacetate by the same malate dehydrogenase we had in the citric acid cycle. At this point, we have done something different, very, very different from the citric acid cycle. Remember, this guy is going to go to exaloacetate. These guys have gone to exaloacetate. We have two, exaloac two exaloacetates. This means every time we turn the glyoxylate cycle, we are making an extra exaloacetate. What's exaloacetate used for? Many things, but gluconeogenesis. This means that bacteria, plants, and yeast can make glucose from acetyl-CoA. We can't do that. At least we can't do it in net amounts. If we start using our exaloacetate to make glucose, we lose our citric acid cycle. So bacteria, plants, and yeast can, can make glucose in net amounts from acetyl-CoA. We cannot. Okay, I'll say more about that next time. See you guys then.